Another method mentioned in Chapter 12 um, that often causing confusion is one class classification. So I'm going to use one class support vector machine as a one example to demonstrate the use of one class classification. So, um, you know, when we think about classification, it's putting things into different classes. So it's hard for people to imagine at the beginning, when will you have a situation where you have one class and you want to classify things? Um, so one application area that's often um, um, needing one class classifier is the outlier detection. So we have a group of set of data all belonging to some the same class, but some are outliers. I mean, they, um, for example, U of A students, we all, everybody in this data set is a student and the students have um, different academic performance. And we want to, um, within this group of students, um, finding typical um, behavior or performance, academic performance, and differentiate that with um, extremely different um, behaviors. Uh, student performing extremely well versus student um, performing um, um, really, really um, bad. Um, um, you have um, in chapter 12, we're going to talk about a number of different outlier types. There are um, contextual outliers and, and other outliers. Um, but we have basically a group of data. We want to find things that belong, but not quite, and not similar to um, the majority of the other data points. So those is outlier detection. Those are not noises. Those are outliers. Um, legitimate data observation points with good values. Only their behavior is different from the rest of the class. Um, so this is really can be um, formulated as a problem of data description. Um, recall at the beginning, we talked about mining tasks. We have predictive task and we have descriptive task. At that time, we mentioned that a lot of times when you learn description is to predict um, two separate um, um, normal, behave, normal performance versus um, outlier performances. Um, but um, um, uh, one class um, data description or one class classifiers, one class classifiers goal is to describe this data class so that we can use this description to differentiate observations that belongs to this data class um, and those that do not belong. Um, so the training examples um, for um, those one class classific classifiers contains the labeled data for one class. Actually, the label doesn't really matter here because all the observations um, given as train example to a one class classifiers are considered to belong to the same class. Okay, so um, in the R demo that you will see shortly, um, you will see that how that is done. Um, there are um, one class um, uh, support vector machines. There are different um, variants and some other non support vector machines for one class classification. Um, I want to mention that obviously one class classification is much more challenging than the multi class classification. Because in multi class classification scenarios, you have training examples for different classes. It's much easier to differentiate classes when you have training examples for each um, of different classes that you care. Um, and also our R demonstration, I'm going to show you that. Um, one class, um, an interesting question come up in previous class is whether one class support vector machines is a supervised or a unsupervised learning method. Um, okay, so um, in the literature, when you look at one class support vector machines, it's often um, 
labeled as an unsupervised outlier detection method. It makes sense because when you use support vector machines, you give support vector machines all the data you have, assuming those all coming from the same class. And the support vector machines will be able to tell you that um, some of the data that you provided is, out, is outside of the boundary of the normal class. So in that sense, you did not provide um, um, one class support vector machines labels for outlier um, observations and the labels for normal observations. It is the support, support vector, um, the algorithm itself um, to find that decision boundary and saying those data points are normal and the rest of those are uh, outliers. So in that sense, it is unsupervised because you did not label the outlier detection. However, in general, we do not give support vector machines mixed class examples. That's not how it's used. The data you provided to support vector machines should all belong to the same class, the same conceptual class. So you do actually, in that sense, you labeled. Um, you have to select those cases, right? So from all the different cl possible classes, you select this group of data and give it to support vector machine and ask for outliers and the normal class. Um, so I would consider the one class support vector machines as extreme case of supervised learning. In this case, you actually literally do not need to literally label the class, but conceptually, um, those, um, those all the examples that you provided to um, the support vector machines um, by default is understood belonging to the same class. Only within this same class, some examples are performed, are be, have normal behavior where the others behave slightly differently. Okay, um, so that's, um, um, okay, so here is the illustration. When you, so again, we're illustrating in a, a, a two-dimensional space and you can imagine in a higher dimensional space, instead of learning the circle as a boundary, we have to learn a hypersphere as a boundary. So those plus signs are our data and those um, um, yellow circles are also our data. Um, the only difference is that those yellow circles um, um, uh, located on the decision boundary, and therefore we call them what? Support vectors, right? Um, so the goal of support vector is to, given all the data that you give it to it, it will try to learn a hypersphere um, to cover those. So this example show um, a, a hard um, decision boundary where all the training examples are included inside this sphere. But for, um, for outlier detections, you don't want this because you will not be able to find outliers. You're actually going to give the system a slack variable. Um, so remember earlier, uh, when we do um, the, the normal support vector uh, machines, we have this um, arrow allow, allow um, arrows in the decision um, process. Um, therefore, you give a slack variable. In our R exercise, you can see this variable is named U. Um, um, so when with this slack variable, the circle going to be smaller. It will allow some of the um, data points to be outside of the boundary. Similar idea as when we look at the um, the, the typical, the binary support vector uh, machines where we do actually allow some data points to appear in the middle of the street, okay? Um, I think I covered the content on this slide. Let's move on. Um, so mathematically, um, the hypersphere um, is going to be quick. Um, the hypersphere is characterized by a center alpha and the radius r. And the goal is to minimize the volume of the sphere by minimizing r squared. 
um, and we the minimization problem becomes r squared with the slack variable, and this is the potential arrows with constraints. Okay, um, so the process is very similar. It's again is a constraint convex quadratic optimization problem. We're going to use a quadratic objective function. Um, it has a quadratic objective function with linear constraints. Therefore, this optimization problem can is solvable using quadratic programming. Um, I have found a very good um, video demonstration to show you mathematical derivation. If you're interested, check out this um, video. Um, so this is the general idea, and we're going to do a little R exercise using um, the one-class um, support vector machine shortly.